So, um, building blocks. So I want to talk about a couple of the pieces involved. And we're going to have to go through this pretty quick because we only have an hour. Um, and this, we're going to try to touch on a few different pieces uh, of the puzzle. Um, I want to start with microformats because that's sort of uh, it, it's used in the most other things, and it's sort of the foundation uh, of most of the interop we have here. Um, thanks to Shane, we have a fancy new website, microformats.io, that is a nice little intro to um, to microformats now, which is um, which is which is great. So the basic idea with microformats is uh, if you have HTML already uh, for a blog post or an address or uh, whatever it is, then uh, what's the least amount of additional code you can add to add structure to the HTML? Um, so this example is uh, marking up an address uh, and uh, email and Twitter profile. Um, which is what's called an H card in microformats, and that's just uh, refers to the the uh, car H card is from V card, which is the contact uh, address book kind of object of a, representing a person or a organization or things like that. Um, so in this example, if you have some plain HTML like this, then you would add these classes uh, to add to give it structure. Um, and these prefixes are, uh, there's a couple of rules for them, and they're good to, they're not too hard to memorize the rules of when you use them, but they're basically just parser instructions, and everything else is vocabulary. So what I mean by that is um, you always see H around an object that is, uh, that, that says, like, this is a blank. So H is the wrapper object around everything for this H card. Um, for blog posts, you'll see H entry. And then there's a handful of others. Um, and then um, within the H card, we have properties like name, street, address, locality, postal code, email, URL. And this prefix tells the parser where to get the value. Um, but before I describe those, I want to jump to the uh, end result of that, which is um, Actually, we'll go here. Yep. So uh, apparently, U is for user and P is for property. What's the H mnemonic? Uh, not exactly. So let me first parse this example. So I'm just pasting this HTML uh, into the parser, and then here's the parsed result. So what we see is um, it turned the HTML into this JSON structure based on the uh, and here's all the names of the of the classes we had. So if I put this side by side with the original HTML, um, then we'll go through the the prefixes. So H card tells it that everything inside here is an item, and that's why it shows up in this items uh, as as an item in the list of type H card. So P means use the plain text value of the HTML element. So everything inside the span becomes the value. So that's why the name is Emma Goldman here. Uh, same is true for those. U means use the uh, uh, URL value. So for an does it specifically mean href or is it more? Yeah. So for an A element, it means href. For an image element, it means source. Okay. So whichever attribute is appropriate to that. Element. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, but and it's URLs, but it's basically for URL. Um, and then there's uh, one other one, which is uh, DT, which is for time elements to get the time attribute. Because uh, date, date time oh. attribute. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the reason this is, uh, I, I like this a lot because it basically means that when you're consuming an HTML page, you can completely forget that it's HTML, and you run it through a parser, and you end up with a nice JSON data structure. And that, that conceptual leap, once I sort of realized that that was how I could use this, then all of a sudden, I don't have to even think about the fact that I'm parsing HTML anymore. 
because uh, parsing HTML is a mess. It's kind of hard, and I don't want to do it, but I don't have to because the microformats just makes it a nice data structure. Um, but of course, this is all, uh, in order for this to work, you have to have HTML in the first place, which is why, uh, which is like a basic premise of being on the web is that you have HTML, you have a web page with HTML, uh, it's indexable, it's crawlable, and with microformats, it then turns into structured data. Um, yeah. So is H stands for HTML? Uh, no, I believe H is, um, Tontek, do you know, do you have an actual answer for this? Because I keep making things up. <laughs> H started out as, Mike Fermat started out with H Cardinal. Oh, you should grab the talking block so the live stream can hear us. Okay. Or the microphone. Sorry. Yeah. Or is, did that one die? That might, be, that might have died. That one should be on. How do I? Does it go to sleep? It might go to sleep. Oh, did that work? Did that work? No. no. Toss it over here. He went to sleep. All right. Check one, two. No? Nope. Check one, two. Just have to talk into uh, Aaron shirt collar. Yeah. <laughs> Three handheld, two for the Poe. To handheld, do this. This one. Okay, cool. My car started out with, uh, there we go, uh, H card and H calendar for both. And because those were V card and I count from the ITF, H card basically stands for the HTML version. Check, check, check. That's fine. All right, swap again. Yeah, my format started out as the HTML versions of V card and I calendar. So that's how we came up with that's how I came up with H card and H calendar. Literally, H card stands for HTML V card, and H calendar stands for HTML um, I calendar. So that's the H comes from HTML version of these other uh, okay. formats, which were well established and worked great. And I was like, well, why don't we just copy those into HTML but using class names? and not like reinvent anything. I always like the description that the H is an upside down micro sign. Yeah, that was like a uh, after the fact yeah. description. It's kind of a funny coincidence. Um, but then in Microformats 2, we realized that having prefixes helped both authors with distinguishing which classes were microformats classes and parsers, and we were able to make a generic parser. So that, that's how H dash came about. And that is, that's the story of H dash. Um, okay, so any, any questions so far? So this is all, yeah, so this is all based on the premise that you have HTML, so um, uh, Ward, that's why I was mentioning that this is, uh, this needs. But it sounds like your preferred format is uh, JSON when you're consuming it. You run it through a parser and you get JSON. And then you run it through a parser and you actually get a native data structure yeah. to whatever um, language you're using. The, the, the parser just turns into like, this is an object, it has an array, it has a string inside of it. Um, it's convenient. It's an established to parser that uh, I yeah. can run in JSON, or I mean in JavaScript. Yep, so they're. In several languages. In, in which, several which, languages. Which language is your preference? JavaScript? You're asking me, I, a coffee script. Coffee script, do we have a coffee script parser? I don't. Oh, no, JavaScript. no, but you can use JavaScript libraries in coffee script, right? Yeah. Um, oh. So here's the here's the list of the parsers. Uh, each one has a link to a website where you can test the parser, like I was showing, uh, to see how it behaves with um, with an input input, and then also links to the library for the parser. There's a handful in development that aren't quite as mature as these, uh, but these are the ones that are mature. Um, and by that, I mean like they, there's a test suite and they pass 
almost all of the tests, um, sometimes minus a few edge cases. Any interest in Perl support? Any interest in Perl support? Yes, or does it exist on the team? I don't think anybody's written a Perl parser yet. There is an old Perl parser for Microformats 1. For classic Microformats that was very comprehensive. So that could probably take a looking at to see what it would take to update that to Microformats 2. I would guess that with as much work that was put into the original one, that it wouldn't be that much work to add Microformats 2 parsing, since that's more, way more generic and simpler. The, the nice thing about Microformats 2 is that the parsing rules don't depend on vocabulary anymore. So all the property names are no, no longer hard-coded into the parser, which means you can so H card has a couple of well-defined properties, but that's really just for consumers. Um, that's not for the parser. The parser doesn't care what you call something. You can do H dash whatever, you can do P dash whatever, and it'll get parsed. Um, consumers may not know what that means, but that's a different story. Yeah, um, Yeah. so uh, let's go through a couple of, um, of examples. Um, Mine may not be the cleanest HTML, but let's see what happens. Um, if I look at this, this is a, a photo with uh, some text, and I have a, a published date, and I have a tag. So if we start looking at the HTML here, um, we'll see there's where I have H entry, which is on the, this item which wraps the whole post. Um, and inside here I have uh, eContent name, which is a common pattern you'll see for uh, text, text notes that don't have a title like a blog post. Um, and then there's in here, there should be a photo. Uh, so there's the, there's the u dash photo telling it that the value of the photo is this source attribute. Um, there's a publish date down here dt dash published, so the value is this date time attribute. Uh, what else is in here? There's a tag uh, category. And the value of the category is p dash category, even though it's on an a tag, because the value is just this, not the URL. Um, and if I run this through the parser, then uh, here's what we get. We get a. Uh, Oh yeah, I didn't. I, there's also a location where it says Portland, Oregon. Um, I don't have my Chrome extension for collapsing JSON arrays in this browser. Um, here's the category, here's the name, here's the photo. Uh, uh, I probably list, I probably actually have that in two places. Yeah, I think I have a P category on this inside the uh, text as well. Um, so what this means is that why this is useful. Um, when I reply to a post on Ben's site, for example, I write this post, and then notice how I'm showing his, his uh, thing I'm replying to up here. And I've pulled out just the pieces of information that I want from it. So I have his photo, his name, his URL, his uh, text. And I did that because his URL is marked up with microformats. So basically, when I'm consuming this page, I'm not consuming this HTML. Uh, I'm, the way I see it is like this, where here's the author information, here's the, uh, the content of the post, and uh, published date category, name, et cetera. Uh, and that lets me pull out just, just the pieces I want to show up in the reply context. Uh, and that's also how, his, how my comment appeared on his post. So it's a, it's a powerful building block. It lets us do a lot of the interactions and, and things like that. Uh, there's a handful of other vocabulary that are interesting, um, which are, uh, let's see. Do we have an H entry page on the Indie Web Wiki? We do. Um, for each kind of post, like notes or articles or replies or photos, um, 
there'll be different properties that you would use on those posts. And uh, there's essentially just like a handful of core properties that you need to worry about, and the rest uh, you can just sort of learn by example. Um, and for making up new things, uh, like you'll notice that some of these are, are uh, relatively uncommon occurrences in here, but uh, there's some examples of things like um, scrabbles or jams or venues, read posts. People have been talking about that this weekend. Um, and you can sort of create new vocabularies by trying things out, trying to interoperate with other people, and, and develop them from there. Uh, this is anyweb.org slash posts. So at some point when you vouch, like a statement that, you know, yeah, I vouch for you. Uh, about. Vouch is a, uh, do you mean vouch in the web mention term, or? Um, I mean, I guess I, I, I need to look. I know there's an actual uh, protocol that's for specification and things like that, um, but that's, it's a kind of statement that was going to post publicly. So I'm just speaking about that in general. Mm. So but that, uh, that may, may not be relevant to, uh, to my experience. Yeah, I guess it depends on what the goal of the vouch post would be. But you could definitely, um, if, you, if you mention somebody in a post, you can mark up the, the name and the URL with an H card so that you're mentioning them. So it can, you can extract that information there. And that could be a kind of a vouch. Um, OK, so that's, based, that's quick microformats. Yeah? Uh, what's the sort of? Uh, best way of handling stuff that you maybe want to have machine readable, but not necessarily show to people on your mm. What's the question? What's the best way to make something machine readable but not necessarily show it? Yeah. Um, there's a couple. You can hide it with CSS, but you it feels can, like a hack. You can hide it with CSS, which is kind of a hack. Um, it is a hack, yes. Uh, I, so the first, the first question I would ask is, uh, why do you want to not make it visible, and are you sure you don't want to make it visible? Mm -hmm. And the answer might be yes, but but I always double check myself when I'm trying to make something machine readable that's not visible. Um, the the classic problem with making machine readable stuff is that because it's not visible, uh, you don't get to sort of visually inspect and verify it, and it becomes easier to have it sort of bit rot where it becomes out of date, or you forget that it's there, and then it's just useless information. So try to avoid that. But it, there are some cases where I found it's useful to have hidden, uh, hidden things. Um, so that's an example of that. The, uh, the Realme uh, links on my own, on my own site, jdrink.org, uh, I have those hidden uh, because I added it to the, uh, the static site generator, so it's boilerplate on every page, which it doesn't need to be there. And on the top page, I have actual, which is a markdown, I have explicit at the link. So, there's, so they're actually duplicated. Uh, one of the boilerplate has the realm me, and the other one doesn't. So one of them is visible, and one of them is machine the, uh, that, That's kind of related to the example I was going to give here, which is um, if you notice on this post, I don't actually have my photo or my name visible inside of the H entry. Um, some people have their picture up here. I'm actually thinking about adding it, but it's not there right now. Um, so if you look inside of this li element, there is no information about who wrote it. Instead, that's down at the bottom, but that's outside of the h entry. So when you look at the uh, parsed result, um, uh, let's go down to author. Notice how there's an author property, which is my URL. That isn't visible. And I decided to do that because I didn't want to have my visible author information inside the post because it's already at the bottom of the page. I didn't want to duplicate it visually. But I do want to link them so that people who are consuming this post know that, how to get my author information. So inside of here, I have a, um, I have a, uh, a tag with no text inside of it that's u dash author linking to my home page. So it's a hidden element, essentially, right? 
uh, and that makes it show up in the parsed result, which then a consumer can say, okay, the author is this URL. Oh, look, there's an H card on the page also at the bottom, and the URL matches. And then you can find my photo and things like that. Um, I believe I also have, um, I have the actual, so I show Portland, Oregon, but I don't want to show the latitude, longitude numbers because they're pretty much meaningless to most people unless you're super, super map geek. You can, I, I, I have a sense of where 45 and negative 122 is, but I realize not everybody else does. Um, so I have those in data elements so that they're hidden. And the parsing rules say that for data elements, if you use the P prefix, it comes out of the value attribute rather than the inside of the, te uh, the data element. So you can, you can sort of hide stuff that way. But again, it's, you should have a very good reason for hiding it if you're not gonna, sh if you're not gonna show it. Is there an HTML tag? Uh, yeah, data is an HTML tag. HTML5. Um, yeah, so that's a little, I think a little nicer than hiding with CSS, but, um, okay, so. 10.33. Any other microformats questions? Because I would like to move on to any of the other four things we have to cover. <laughs> um, but this is important because this is sort of the, the groundwork for the rest of them. Um, so the other ones I want to cover are WebVention, Micropub and in relation to Micropub, talking about indie auth. Uh, I think Web Mention is a good place to start to go next. So who here has um, is already familiar with uh, already familiar with Web Mention in some form? Yeah. I don't know if I'd say I'm familiar with it, but I did send an RSVP. Okay. Um, so let me try to make this Web Mention intro quick then, since most people are somewhat familiar with it. Um, what I mentioned. Uh, what I mentioned is basically an evolution of the pingback spec. Pingback was um, XML RPC interface for telling sites that one blog link to another blog. Um, what I mentioned is a the same uh, payload of this site links to this site, but it's done as just a form post since that's all it really is and you don't need anything fancy for that. Um, so this, this spec is basically just a long explanation of send these two values, send source and target. Um, if I write a post to, uh, in reply to Ben, this is very convenient, my last reply is in reply to Ben. Um, I made this link on my page. This is a URL to this post. Um, ben wrote a post with this URL. So when I send Ben to web, web mention, I'm, send, I'm saying this post at this URL links to this post at this URL. Um, so the question is, where do I send the web mention? So I, I first have to discover his web mention endpoint. Um, and that's probably the hardest part about the web engine spec, because um, once you know that, then you just send the payload. So if we just go view source on this, I bet we can find it. Um, <laughs> this post is about web engine, so the text web engine appears everywhere. There it is. So he in his HTML has a link tag uh, with rel equals web engine. And that is telling me that that's his web engine endpoint. Uh, there's a couple other ways you can you can advertise this. You can advertise it in an HTTP header, um, and that way you can send web engines to things that aren't HTML. So if you have if you want to accept web engines on images or on JSON documents or whatever that isn't an HTML page, you can advertise it in the HTTP header. Um, once I know that this is his web engine endpoint then I can send a web engine to it. And I can demonstrate that with curl. Uh, because it really is just a form post. Uh, 
then to that. We say source equals my post, and target is his post. That screen's a little behind. There we go. So I just said, send a post to send a post to his web mention endpoint source my URL target his URL. Uh, the response is 202 accepted, which basically he's saying, got it. I'm going to work on that later. From my point of view, I'm done. And everything else is now on his end to do something with the web mention. Um, most of the time, what people do with web mentions is uh, first verify that the link is, is there. Because uh, it's, it's obviously, this is, there's no reason to trust this post initially. I can just I can just spam this with URLs all day long, and um, he would end up with spam comments that don't exist. So his first step is double check that um, my URL exists and that it contains a link to his post. Uh, secondly, he will then uh, parse the mic formats from the page and extract things like the author, the my comment text, and things like that in order to render it as a comment. Um, typically, that all happens asynchronously because it's, it's uh, an external HTTP fetch um, and you may end up doing additional work uh, or maybe you want to have a manual comment approval queue. So that's why it's a 202 response, just saying, I got your web mention, I'm working on it. Um, and then uh, if he's able to find comment text and things like that, then he might actually show it as a comment. Can you grab the little block, talking block? Oh. I think that's. OK, so. Ah, uh, crap. You... I thought I'd turn it on. Never. Never mind, it's not on. Oh. So if you submit the request and you get the 202 accepted, which means I'm working on it, maybe, uh, how do you know when it's complete? So when you see the 202 response, how do you know when it's complete? Um, there's, a, there's nothing in the spec itself for that because uh, it's not necessary for this for the whole workflow to work, but there's some extensions and some experiments on ways to do that. Um, actually, I don't think anything's been written up as an extent, a formal extension yet, but there are a couple of ways that people are, are doing, are allowing you to see the status of it. Um, a, uh, one common way is to return, instead of 202, you can return 201 with a location saying this, this web mention request has been created. Here's a URL where you can check on the request. Um, that part is in the spec. What the actual contents of that URL is not in the spec. Um, and that ends up being um, uh, useful when you're manually doing, doing this and debugging things, because you, then you get a URL that you can check to see um, was this, was this uh, uh, accepted. Um, if I, I can show that by just sending a junk web mention to my endpoint. So here it says 201 created, and then here's a, a URL that I got back. And if we open this up, um, it will probably say that it's not valid because Oh, <laughs> it is valid. Uh, I meant to do that the way, other way around, but yes. This, this web engine is valid. Uh, this was the source, this was the target. And then here's the information that webengine.io extracted from the page. Um, I opened that up too late, but if I opened it up immediately, it would have said queued, and just like it's waiting, right? And then this, this will change. So this eventually, I, I would like to see this written up as an extension where the actual contents of this URL is specified so that consumers can actually rely on what it says. But you don't actually need that for the web engine itself to go through. Um, OK. So web mentions, um, yeah, so that enables commenting. Uh, and then depending on what the microformats of the post are, that can determine whether something is a comment or a like or a repost or uh, other things like that. Uh, all right, anything else with that? Did 
there's um, more about WebEngine is uh, some of these extensions, which are, there's three right now. There's Vouch, which is an attempt at an anti-spam technique, because right now it's possible to register a junk URL, a junk domain, put up some spam on it, and then send a valid web mention, which will pass all the web mention checks, because it does contain a link. But you may not actually want that. So Vouch is an attempt to, uh, to counteract the potential spam. And we know that since, uh, we know that pingback was spammed like crazy. So this, because this is the same mechanism, once this has any level of adoption at the level that pingback had, which basically means once WordPress has it, it will be spammed. Um, so we're trying to get ahead of that in the meantime by trying things out uh, proactively. Um, Sal mention is uh, an extension to um, essentially do like threaded comment threads where you notify people of comments on your post so that you can have conversations that continue beyond just one level of reply. We don't have time to go into that right now. And then uh, private web mention is a uh, first attempt at um, if you have a post that isn't public but you want to send a web mention from it, if someone tries to verify the link that exists, they're going to get uh, access denied. So this provides a mechanism for the receiver of the web mention to actually fetch the page um, with some sort of authentication. Um, and it, we don't have time to go into that, but that's a fun, fun topic as well. Um, and these are listed in the spec because there are multiple impl implementations of, of them in the wild right now. So let's move on to uh, Micropub. And this is going to be the fastest intro to Micropub I've ever done. So <laughs> um, let's see if we can do this. Um, Micropub, the idea behind Micropub is um, Actually, quick question. Would you rather learn about Micropub, which is an API, API for creating posts, so it basically enables apps for indie web posting, uh, or WebSub, which is the spec formerly known as PubSub Hubbub, which enables real-time subscriptions to things uh, and feed readers and real-time web? Uh, quick show of hands for Micropub. For what? Micropub. What's the verb? Uh, web sub is the other spec. I just, I'm just trying to. The question. the question is, which should I cover first? Oh, okay. In case we run out of time. I both are web sub more versatile, I guess. Uh, web sub is easier and might be quicker. So let me do that first. It's also less well understood. Okay, fair. Um, so, web sub, formerly known as PubSub Hubbub, uh, in case you're familiar with that, is basically a way to. Um, subscribe to changes of things. Um, so, for example, my homepage has a list of posts, and I post new things on my homepage. If you want to subscribe to my homepage and get an update about when I publish a new post, you can use WebSub. Um, otherwise, your option is you pull the page. So, you can pull, uh, if you have like a, a reader where you're following a dozen people, you can pull all of the, the feeds that you're subscribed to, um, but that gets tedious really quick. So WebSub is basically a way to be notified when something new is published in those feeds. Um, so usually it's done, it's used for lists of items, but technically it can also be used for just when it, a single post is updated. Most people only use it for lists of things. Um, so the basic idea behind WebSub is um, I, have a, I have a URL like my homepage or even a, uh, a tag page. And um, as a publisher, I've said, I, I use this hub. And I link to the hub. And like we saw with um, WebMention, um, I link to it in, I think in my case, I actually have it in the HTTP header. So here is the, my hub. Um, so as a subscriber, you would say, all right, I want to get updates about this page. Let me go find the hub. 
you discover the, the hub URL, and then you make the subscription request to it. And the sub subscription request is basically just, um, here's the URL I want to subscribe to, and here's where you can deliver the updates. Um, then you have to do a little verification where you, uh, you acknowledge that you created that request, and then the subscription is active and you just wait for, for notifications. Um, as a publisher, whenever I make a new post, I tell my hub, I just updated these feeds, please go deliver that to all of my subscribers. And then the hub is res responsible for um, maintaining the list of subscribers and then actually making the delivery uh, of the notifications. And it will actually deliver the full document to the subscribers. So it'll, um, it'll take my, my HTML on this feed page, put that in the payload, send it to the subscribers. So it's a pretty simple mechanism, um, and it, it doesn't care about what content type the, the page is. So you can use it for HTML, for RSS, Atom, JSON, whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, the spec, the spec itself doesn't care. So for any web feeds, you'll often see um, microformats, HTML pages being used as the topic URLs that you can subscribe to. Um, in when it was PubSub Hubbub, it was mostly used only for like Atom and RSS feeds. Um, but then that, that sort of evolved to allow other kinds of content because turns out there's more things on the internet than RSS. Um, and yeah, so now we get to use it for all sorts of, all sorts of things. Um, any questions about that basic mechanism? So is there anything in place for if you have a million subscribers? Um, so that is exactly what Pubs of Hubbub and WebSub were created to address. Yeah. So the challenge is if, if I as a publisher have a million subscribers, then yeah, it's, that's a lot of work to actually deliver all those notifications. So that's the reason for the hub separation. Otherwise you could have subscribed just to something in that in on my site, right? So if you notice, my hub is actually not on my website. It's a different URL. And that's because I've chosen to use a service that I believe can handle a vo that volume, right? So Superfeeder is another good example. And I, I'm sure Superfeeder can handle way more than that, that one I wrote. I'm sure Superfeeder can handle way more than mine can. Um, but that's exactly for that separation so that the publisher doesn't have to worry about how many subscribers it has. All it has to do is say, hey, uh, hub, I updated this page. And then the hub says, all right, I've got a million subscribers. I know how to deal with that. And you just, you find a hub that you trust to be able to handle that volume and then let it go to town. Um, but yeah, if you, if you don't think you're gonna have a million subscribers, you can also put the hub on your site yeah. and you can own the whole infrastructure that way. Uh, so it's a nice way to have options of where you're hosting things and who you're delegating it to and what infrastructure you use. I have a question about doing the, the notify on publish. So mm -hmm. you, you've got like a tag of bike tone here. If you have, that, if, that, if you have a new post that would show up in bike tone, but would also show up like on your homepage, need to announce multiple URLs have changed to your hub? Yeah, let me summarize that question. So uh, in this case, I have a page with a, a tag for Bike Town, and this post also shows up on my homepage. So when I, um, when I add this post, as a publisher, I have to know which feeds of mine it's going to show up on, and then I, I tell the hub, I've updated all of these feeds. So for each tag for and my homepage, um, I will tell the publisher to send an out, send announcements for all of those different feeds. Because yeah, I basically I did update a bunch of feeds by making one post. Right. What what is the client that you use What are the what client can you use to subscribe to them? Um, so most of that is done in readers. So um, like RSS readers um, and Woodwind is a, is a um, indie web reader. That would be typically what you would use to subscribe to it. Uh, so if I go to woodwind.xyz, um, 
and log in. Woodwind is a, is a service that's running on a server, and you know, I'm using it, and then I can subscribe to things, and then it goes as a, uh, it's a consumer, and it subscribes to people's pub sub, or web sub feeds, and um, uh, here's the list of sub subscriptions, and then you know, it tells me when each feed was last updated. Um, and it used to show the stats on the web sub subscription, like when it was last, when it got a last notification, but it doesn't show that anymore. But yeah, so this is a subscriber, and it will be handling all those um, uh, those web sub notifications from from my hub. So it doesn't necessarily have to see the post that you send. It. Uh, it can't check from the hub. The hub only delivers the notification, but it, uh, subscribers will often also pull periodically um, just as like a sort of fallback in case something went offline, something went wrong somewhere. Um, but as someone who, who is, is writing a, actually I did this in Own Your Swarm, where Foursquare will send me a push notification when someone checks in, but sometimes it doesn't, and sometimes those fall, fall away. So I also have a polling schedule, but I don't use that for, it, it's like super uh, fallback. It's not very frequent, right. And it's just to make sure I, I get everything in there. So that's sort of a safety measure that subscribers will do sometimes as well. Um, yeah, um, any other questions about that? All right. How, how do I know, like, on, on your site that you you support as as a, as, a, as an end user? How do I know that you support this on your site and support your URL? Mm. How as a so how do you, how do you know as a, a user looking at my site that I support uh, web sub? Yeah. Um, you there's nothing visible on my site that tells you that I support web sub because um, uh, well I actually don't know why we don't really. That's not really a thing. What's of, the question? Kind of. There's no indication on my site that I support WebSub. So if you take this URL and plug it into a reader, the reader um, should check if it supports WebSub itself and use that. And if it doesn't, it should just pull the site. Right. So from an end user perspective, you don't really need to know if it supports WebSub because you can still get the updates anyway. Yeah. I guess. Um, I guess then the second question is, uh, how do you know that you can even subscribe to this at all? Because uh, there's no indication visibly that there's microformats or any sort of structured data on the page. Uh, it might just be unstructured HTML that a reader can't support. Um, but kind of like a follow button. Kind of like a follow button. Um, follow buttons are something that are not super well explored yet. Probably because if of... If there was a follow button, that would indicate from a UX perspective that there's something here to subscribe to. Yeah. And I, I have an attempt at a follow button on my site, uh, which does actually work if you click it. Some of us are using uh, subtome.com. Yes. We have subtome follow buttons. Subtome uh, is another exploration of follow buttons. Um, but yeah, that's there's, there's basically just like, there's basically a couple ways of doing it right now, and uh, it's a relatively unexplored. Uh, not a lot of consensus around it yet. Um, cool. Okay, let's let's do MicroPub in three minutes. <laughs> um, yes, it is. Um, so MicroPub is a client server API, um, and if that doesn't mean anything to you, what that means is it's an API that uh, client side apps, either native apps or web apps or desktop apps, can use to talk to create posts on the server. Um, when, when I'm writing a post, I actually don't have any place in my website that I can use to create a post. 
So I have to use an external application to create posts. Uh, most of the time I use Quill, which is a uh, micropub app that I wrote. Looks like this, I sign in. Um, and once I'm signed in, it gives me an interface for writing posts. And then when I fill this out, Quill makes a micropub request to my site. My site says, uh, does the authentication pass? Uh, is it for Aaron? Uh, what is this, what's the properties of the post? And it makes a new post and it stores it and then it renders it and does all the, sends web engines, sends uh, web sub notifications and all that. Um, so if you want to, um, that, so the, the nice thing about, about using Micropub is that it separates, it means that you no longer need to be responsible for, for creating all the interfaces for creating posts. You get to piggyback on a lot of existing work. Uh, for example, I'm not really an iPhone developer, um, so I'm not gonna be writing an iPhone app for creating posts anytime soon, but thankfully the micro.blog iOS app supports Micropub, so I can use it to post to my site. And now I have an iPhone app that I can use to post to my site. That's pretty neat. Um, there's also a handful of other tools like Own Your Gram and Own Your Swarm, which will import your Foursquare check-ins and your Instagram photos as Micropub requests to your site. Um, and I wrote those because um, I do actually like using Swarm um, for a number of reasons. I'm not going to stop using it, even though I have check-ins on my site. And Instagram, um, it's a pretty good app for posting photos, and it has some good adjustment utilities and things like that. And there's people on it who I still want to talk to, and they don't have an API for posting to it. So my only option is um, using Instagram to post the photo first. But then I want that on my site. So with Micropub, that app will create the uh, um, Great to post on my site. So, without getting into too much of the uh, of the details, if you are, um, let's see, if you want to, probably the best uh, way to get started is either Quill or the Test Suite. Um, so, if you try to log in as uh, someone new, uh, you'll get this screen, which basically walks you through. Uh, it's like, oh, I don't know, uh, I don't see any of the things I need yet. So let me walk you through setting them up. And it will set up the authorization aspect first. Uh, it needs a place where it can get an access token so that it has credentials to post to your site. And then the Micropub endpoint itself. Um, the nice thing about uh, this workflow is that you can skip building anything for the first two. You don't need to write an authorization endpoint or a token endpoint first. Uh, you can just use these services that do it for you, um, and you can jump right to writing the Micropub endpoint. Now, obviously, I can't create a Micropub endpoint for your site uh, because everyone's site is, uses different storage on the back end and that works differently. Um, but you can, you can start your journey down this path right there instead of having to first do all this crazy work about creating access tokens and having a sign-in interface. Um, so creating a Micropub endpoint is, um, basically what's gonna happen is the client's gonna send you a post request and it's gonna contain just a few properties. It's gonna contain H equals entry, which is from microformats, um, saying we're creating an entry. And then it's gonna send you a bunch of microformats properties as, as a post request. It's gonna send content, category, location, in reply to, like of, other, uh, these are all microformats vocabulary. Uh, properties. So in H entry, in the microformats H entry spec, there's a handful of properties listed there. Those are all used in the Micropub request as well. Uh, so in the header, when it says authorization bearer such and such, uh, how does the Micropub endpoint interpret that? Great. So the question is when you get the header with authorization bearer, how does the Micropub endpoint interpret that? Um, two answers. Answer number one, it's entirely up to you. It's not part of the standard because everybody might want to do it differently. If you write your own, if you issue your, your own access tokens, then you're responsible for creating them and verifying them. If you don't want to issue your own access tokens, which I, I don't recommend doing that as a first step. I do recommend doing that eventually, but it's not a very useful first step. 
um, if you don't want to uh, issue your own, then the endpoint that this recommends, uh, tokens.indieauth.com, has a mechanism for verifying tokens. Okay. So basically, you, the microprobe endpoint sees a bearer token, and then it sends it off to the token the tokens.indieauth.com to check it. And you look at back of response that says yes or no. Okay. Um, and that is uh, not a standard. That's just how that endpoint works. Um, and it's in order to be able to bootstrap and quicker, develop these things quicker. And if not now, eventually it will be very important to actually check the authorization. Uh, it is absolutely very important to check the authorization from the beginning. Otherwise, anybody can create posts on your site. Um, but for starters, I would recommend using tokens.ndos.com or at least downloading that and running it on your own server, um, just because it's one less thing to, to figure out in the beginning. Um, Eventually, it's a good idea to do that yourself, so it's all part of your site. Um, if you, uh, the, so the actual value of the token, uh, there's no structure. It's just a bearer token. It's just an opaque string. So it can be, uh, it can be a JWT. It can be just an ID in a database. It can be whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Um, it's a signed token mechanism. Um, it, it's it's kind of cool because you don't need to store anything for it to work. Um, but there's, you know, as many ways as you want to, to create and verify access tokens. And the nice thing is that microbit clients don't have to worry about what they mean. They're just a string. Um, I do want to mention micropub.rocks, which is the uh, test suite for micropub. Um, and... Uh, let me let me sign into my dev one. Uh, what this does is it lets you test both endpoints, uh, lets you test both endpoints and servers. So if you're writing a client, uh, or endpoints and clients, if you're writing a client, you can use this to. Uh, post to it, and it'll tell you whether you're doing it right. And if you're writing a, a server, it will act as a client, and it'll create posts. So this is a useful tool for, uh, for working on that. Um, so I think we are out of time here. Um, that was hopefully a, gives you a taste of the Micropub spec. Didn't get to go into it too much, but um, I'm happy to answer questions the rest of the day about that, if that's something you want to work on. Um, yeah. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks.